You want to do the big one for the big for the best picture? Well, I think we should both do it. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, you don't know me that well. Mm, you don't know me at all. And finally, <laughs> here are the nine final. Here are the nine films selected as best picture nominees. Call Me By Your Name, Peter Spears. <laughs> Luca Guadagnino. And <laughs> Luca Guadagnino, <laughs> Emilia George, and Marco Morabinto. <laughs> Producers. Darkest Hour, Tim Bevan, Eric Fellner, Lisa Bruce, Anthony McCartan, and Douglas Urbanski, producers. <clears throat> Dunkirk, Emma Thomas, and Christopher Nolan, producers. Get Out, Sean McKittrick, Jason Blum, Edward H. Ham Jr., and Jordan Peele, producers. Ladybird, Scott Rudin, Eli Bush, and Evelyn O'Neill, producers. <laughs> Phantom Thread, Joanne Seller, Paul Thomas Anderson, Megan Ellison, and Daniel Lupi, producers. The Post, Amy Piscale, Steven Spielberg, and Christy McCasco-Curric, Producers. <laughs> the Shape of Water, Guillermo del Toro, and J. Miles Dale, producers. And three billboards outside Evan, Missouri, Graham Broadbent, Peter Zer Zernan, and Martin. McDonough, producers. You know. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Oscar nomination reaction podcast. It is Oscar nomination day. January 23rd. I have a super special guest with me. I have Sasha Stone from Awards Daily. Hello, Sasha. Hello, Eric. So nice to be here. Thank you for asking me. This is good. This is fun. Um, as anybody listening knows, the Oscar nominations came out this morning, just a few hours ago. All of us have been up since five o'clock or couldn't get to sleep last night and maybe have been up most of the night. I swear, I think I like peek over at my clock. I'm like, I know my alarm is on, but I don't want to wake up late. Exactly I, what I, I did. I, exactly the same thing. Oh, yeah. I went to bed. I'm like, I'm going to be so smart. I'm going to bed at 10 o'clock. And I'm like tucked in. I'm like, look at me all super cool. And I sat there for like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like 3 a.m. Okay, I got more time. I'm like, I'm like, can I get up and edit my predictions again? <laughs> Oh, I bet you did really well on your predictions, didn't you? I did a couple. A couple that I really was pretty proud of. Um, I did predict the Martin McDonough snub. Oh my God, did you know it would... No, you probably didn't know it would be. I didn't... Uh, I actually put... I pre I took him out and I had uh, Luca Guarino in instead, thinking, again, that the Academy might be a little more... Uh... Oh, I can hear you. So can you... Oh, Say that again, because I missed that. Yes, um, I, I took Madonna out, but instead of putting in Paul Thomas Anderson, I put in uh, Luca Guadagnino instead. Yeah, um, well, thinking that the Academy that. might be might have pushed it a little bit harder. They didn't, but um, but that was really that was an interesting thing because I just I wasn't sure how much of what's going on, uh, both with you know something like. James Franco and with three billboards, how much of that was going to permeate into the nomination process just, right. just with timing. And, you know, clearly a little bit of timing uh, impacted James Franco and maybe even a little bit three billboards as well. But there's a really good chance he would have been left off anyway, just because 
he's not as well known. I mean, I know he's done in Bruges and things like that. He wasn't doing a lot of campaigning. I don't know if you noticed that, but he wasn't you know, out and about. Neither was Paul Thomas Anderson, really. Yeah. But, you know, we all sort of knew it was going to be maybe four out of the five. But for me, like, I just didn't, I know a couple of people kept saying, oh, no, it's going to be Del Toro. And I was like, there's no way it's going to be Del Toro. And, you know, so trying to figure out who, I couldn't imagine it being Jordan Peele. I could imagine it being Greta Gerwig. And that's who people were predicting. Most people, if they were going to drop one of the DGA five, they were dropping Jordan Peele. And I'm like, I know. Dudes, no, it's, are, are, no, it's not going to be him. <laughs> no, they're going to do everything they can to make sure both of those get in. Um, yeah, um, the it 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 was it wasn't that it was so much of a crapshoot to to drop him, but it's it's what was it? It's been twenty years since we've had all first time nominees um, in best director, Is and that what it is? yeah, nineteen ninety seven was the last time. So oh, wow. this year, if if you were going to go with the DGA five, was going to break that, and and happen again, and you know when you start looking down the list of of who would who would be the the person to kind of replace that, and we just saw it happen last year with Mel Gibson. It was almost a an all first timer top five until Mel Gibson came and crashed that party. God. Um, and early on. Steven Spielberg seemed like, you know, he would be the kind of the veteran that would, you know, take a spot there. And clearly they were not here for the post. So that yeah. wasn't going to happen. Um, but the, they, I mean, it's funny because it, it was a risky pick because of how three, well, three billboards was doing and so many of the precursors, you know, that um, <clears throat> and it actually did really well with the Academy. It got seven and mm -hmm. most people predicting eight it just missed that one it's like when ridley scott missed for the martian you know yeah. sometimes that but that's good because that shows you preference it shows you that it's not as well liked as you know it's not up at the top because if it was it would be absolutely in best director yeah and that that was that was the thing i was like the day before you know trying to spit out pieces as as fast and furiously as i could and i'm Looking at something like Three Billboards because it's now or was a presumptive front runner after SAG. I'm like, okay, so in order for this to keep going, it did really well at BAFTA. In order to keep going, it has to, it still has to hit everything that it needs to hit at the Oscars. And if it misses something major, then you know we're it's it's definitely uh, uh, would be a big hit, and and it now it is. Right. But, and that's that's actually makes it for me, it makes it a lot easier to, to look at the race because that was the one that I didn't see coming, you know, that I hadn't factored in, didn't know was as popular as it turned out to be. It wasn't really my favorite movie. You know, it, it wasn't anything I had been paying attention to or writing about. Um, and so it was kind of it was kind of odd to me that it was doing as well, you know. And so um I tried to, I, I kept trying to factor it in and think about, well, how, what does this race mean if Three Billboards is the movie that's all of a sudden the number one movie? That's really weird. I mean, I know it won in Toronto and everything, but I couldn't square what I knew about the movie, which was it was very politically incorrect, you know, um, with what I know about Oscar season, you know. So, but people kept telling me, no, no, everybody loves it. It's not divisive. It's going to be, you know. <laughs> It'll be fine, but of course, it turned out to be the most divisive movie um, in the lineup. And um, but now that it's out, you know, it's pretty much out. It's like The Martian. I mean, there'll be people that'll still be like, "Oh, it can still win," but it's not. It's not going to win. And but that makes it easier for Fox Searchlight, I'm sure, because now they know they can just put everything behind Shape of Water and they don't have to split it up. Yeah, I mean, even Shape of Water has, you know, comes in with its own obstacles too that it has to overcome. And it's they're big ones too, but um, it's it's interesting. I I had Kyle Buchanan on a few weeks ago, and we were talking about three billboards. And this was kind of when the the backlash was just starting, and it was really, um, I mean, if anybody that's that's kind of following it as to the whys and the whens, is that you know when when the film was presented in festivals. Uh, you know, and outlets sent out their their people to cover it. You're you're looking at places that have primarily, if not almost only, white writers, 
And once it came out and and Black Riders had a chance to see it because they were not the ones sent out at the beginning, the perception was different because right. their, their perception was different. And I think it's the one of the core things uh, that should be kind of taken away from from the season, from criticism and from how we see movies and and uh, and and who sees movies. Um, and that's that's what changed the the tune and changed the game for this movie is is that. And what we had discussed on that was this strange possibility of uh, like, a, like pen, a, pen, a pendulum a pen. swing backwards. So you have these uh, these old white voters that that, you know, just went in with moonlight and now they're kind of feeling like you know maybe this is the is is a movie for us it's a it's a white redemption movie <laughs> right right um and and that kind of that thought at least for me carried carried on a little bit um as a as a possibility i was still pretty much very much in the tank for uh get out and ladybird though um and i still am even though BAFTA really said no to that and the Globes pretty much said no to that too but I I do think and we saw this morning a little bit is that like you said the Academy has a different things in mind right I mean I never saw the narrative shift with three billboards because I never thought of it as a front runner and I know a lot of other people did but it never it never you know occurred to me that that's what it was because it always seemed not like a front runner, <laughs> you know, it never <laughs> did, never not watching it, which I thought it was fine. But so I was always surprised by how many, how many people like that movie. I'm still surprised by it, actually, that so many people really, really like it, you know, and, and, uh, and it's not just white people. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to get into this because I'll get killed, but it's really not just white people who like the movie. It is a, um, a divisive film for sure. And, um, and we are in a new era where, you know, you have to be really, really careful. I'm sorry, my dog just keeps like bugging me to try to <laughs> go out. It's driving me nuts for the last 20 minutes. I'm trying to get him to stop, but he won't. Um, the, uh, you know, I took them out right before I sat down with you, but, um, <laughs> but they, uh, but they're still like, he must have to like go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, but, um, but you know, it's, it was a weird year because we had three different movies that were offensive to the black community. We had, um, the beguiled, which left out the black character, and she was kind of raked over the coals for that. Um, and she was, you know, considered a careless move to have made the film. Catherine Bigelow makes Detroit, which is exactly the opposite of what they're talking about in Three Billboards, because Three Billboards hides the police brutality or smooths it over or tries to pretend that they're forgiving it. And it's something that really can't be forgiven. And in Detroit, it's all about police brutality, the absolute worst kind, the worst kind of evil you can imagine. There's no question about it. It's completely unambiguous what happened at the Algiers Motel. That got killed because she was a white filmmaker and he was a white writer. And mm -hmm. they, black community, black writers and critics felt that it was exploitive of them and their pain and their past and their violence. And then it wasn't that filmmaker's right to tell that story. So then along comes Three Billboards, same thing. It's kind of like the porridge is too cold, the porridge is too hot, the porridge, you know, there's like this this dancing around of the race issue where it just becomes quite apparent that white filmmakers should not be telling these stories, period. And they shouldn't even go near it. And they should let black filmmakers tell those stories because it would be more authentic to the filmmakers, to the critics, to the audiences. Um, and I, I would think anybody would be a fool to take on a movie about race if they're white right now. That just that movie's going to die. I mean, maybe there are some filmmakers that are going to be forgiven, and people might go, "Oh well, I know that's Paul Thomas Anderson, so or Quentin Tarantino, so it's okay." But um, but certainly not Martin McDonough. He was never going to be in that category. So I think it's a weird subject. I think it's a weird time. It's a weird time to be involved in the Oscars because there's so much focus and attention on politics, on the rules of conduct. Everything is, is mm -hmm. very tightly scrutinized and it kind of makes it a weird thing to be a part of anymore for me. Like, 
like uh, it doesn't feel like it's just about finding the Oscar, the best picture anymore. It feels like it's, you know, a, a kind of a, a group meeting about humanity, about American life and culture, you know, and what's the right path and what's representation and who's being represented. And, you know, the Oscars have always just been about white people and their experience. And that's <laughs> it, you know. And as things have broadened out, now we're at a point where it's not good enough to get stories about race told by white filmmakers. Because I think from a black perspective, and I can't obviously speak for black people, but it's not authentic. You know, it's, it's what do you know about it? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah. But I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that nobody wants to hear what I have to say about three billboards. So I just won't even talk about it. But, um, but I never, my point about it being, I know people are going to want to say it was taken down during the Oscar season, but I don't really see it that way. I never really saw it as a film. It could have won. It could have, it had a chance. It had a, like a chance, just like the Martian had a chance last year. You know what I mean? It had a tiny chance. And the Martian, by the way, also got hit with, some pretty hardcore criticism about its casting, even though it it did have a quite a diverse cast. I remember it got it got slammed for that. Um, so it's it's uh, it's a tricky situation. You want to enter the Oscar race being somebody like Lady Bird, where you don't offend anybody. Yeah, uh, the the porridge metaphor that you that you mentioned makes perfect sense because that is basically the preferential ballot. You need yeah. to be the porridge that Goldilocks picks. That's right. Pretty, <laughs> I mean, so far, anyway, you know, I mean, we haven't seen any anybody break that yet. Yeah. Um, it, as far as I can tell. Yeah. And this this is this is the conundrum that I'm having because I just, you know, threw out. A, OK, so what's the front runner now? And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm looking at Best Picture and I'm I'm choosing for the moment uh, the shape of water, even though it completely defies, you know, the SAG cast. Uh, uh, rule, but we're already seeing rules being frayed and broken. Frances McDormand just won. She became the first uh, person to, uh, woman to win uh, Best Actress at SAG twice ever. So things are starting to be chipped away. And part of that is that something like SAG is only 24 years old. Uh, it's, that's right. re it's really young. So to be able to start, you know, stretching its legs outside of uh, uh, its own history <clears throat> is is kind of what's happening. So it's it's entirely possible. You know, that said, it is still super strange that it was not able to get you know that cast nomination mm -hmm. or Octavia Spencer. It seemed it seemed like kind of a no brainer that that would have been pretty easy. Well, it was weird because with Shape of Water, which is obviously one of my favorite movies of the year, I noticed that a lot of people I knew didn't like the movie. Uh, Chris Tapley, not a big fan. My friend Max Weiss thought it was icky and weird, didn't like it. Um, you know, it wasn't I love like... Max. I know, I do, but like Lady Bird was like coming out of Telluride. I was literally the only person that didn't like that movie at Telluride. Everybody loved it. And it's the <laughs> same now, you know, like everybody loves it. So it's not like Shape of Water, which... I think is like a, a love it hate it movie. That's that's its biggest problem um, with the Oscars. But uh, but I will say this about it in terms of being a, a potential stat buster, with all that's going on, you know, with three billboards, you know, and being so controversial, and um, and the, and Get Out and Lady Bird kind of competing with each other, which they are. It seems like um, I could see Shape of Water sort of slipping in as the number one vote, you know, like no recount. Um, mm. That's really the only chance it has, I think. Well, and you know, there's in a, in a, a era of, of scrutiny with diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about the shape of water. Who's all, you know, main players are, uh, a mute woman, a black woman, a gay man, and a fish man. Yeah, exactly. That's, and it deals yeah. with homophobia. It deals with racism. It deals with sexual harassment. It, it deals with, like, the Trump era, you it, know? It really kind of ticks a lot of boxes yeah. um, and and makes a lot of sense, um, you know, and it just won PGA. Uh, yeah, right. But so as you and I know, the way that it just generally has seemed to go is that 
you know, either it's a movie like Birdman, the Birdman year, where it wins it wins PGA, DGA, SAG Ensemble, and wins the Oscar. So that's Argo, King's Speech. You know, those movies are like, forget it. There's no competition ever. But in a year where they split the guilds, which is what we have right now, because obviously, like La La Land last year, um, and The Rev... No, not The Revenant. Did The Revenant? No, The Big Short one. <laughs> the Big Short. Yeah, the last two years, it's not gone with Best Picture. Yeah, so... So that's the thing is like it is it has to be a mixed up year because we already have two very contradictory. Now, what's probably going to happen, the shape of water is probably going to sweep the BAFTAs, I would imagine. Dunkirk might give it a little bit of trouble in some categories, but uh, I know people that are still thinking that Dunkirk will win like picture and director. And I'm just I, I it's it's so hard for me to to see that and to picture that and it's and it's you know these are i you know what i'm hearing from people that you know have followed the race for decades and then also people that have no idea about how the oscars work and they you know will spout off on twitter well obviously dunkirk's winning because it's the bella it's like no just leave 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 this to to people that know what they're talking about yeah Um, not that that's me but i'm just saying no, no, but but you know what's weird about Dunkirk that actually hurts Dunkirk, even though no one would really admit this because they really think it works in reverse. They think that Dunkirk hurts Darkest Hour, but really Darkest Hour hurts Dunkirk, and the reason is, I think, is that the Academy, you know, they're just very actor-driven. It's very, uh, you know, performance-driven, usually their favorites, mm-hmm. and yeah. Dunkirk isn't. Dunkirk is not it's 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 director driven and um it's history driven and those things are true about it but darkest hour is more about the kind of the same thing but it's character driven it's actor driven and it's just got a best picture nomination so i think that the two of those movies together have make it harder for one or the other to really stand out and really take that moment and say this was the churchill moment you know this was the moment of the evacuation at dunkirk because their minds are always drifting over to to darkest hour which is another movie about just a different angle from the same sort of event that was happening um dunkirk could win the dga um but that does still obviously doesn't mean it's gonna a win best picture i really would put my money on ladybird right now to win under the preferential ballot i'm i'm super actually leaning to that as well although wouldn't it be kind of fun if somebody made a mashup of dunkirk and darkest hour together and just merged the scenes into this like back and forth <laughs> made it black and white you know? that's your that's a best picture winner because that covers all the bases <laughs> yeah that's like titanic <laughs> <laughs> that gets your acting and that gets your huge scope too <laughs> absolutely your epic that's your 1940s war epic right there that's it's just, it. they're divided that now would, that would be that would be fantastic <laughs> um, <laughs> um you know it's i'm i'm leaning to lady bird as well because i mean one of the one of the arguments that against dunkirk uh like you just mentioned is that it's director driven and what we are seeing right now in this era of the oscars are you know, directors being recognized for, you know, huge undertakings and and great pieces. But the films that are winning are writer and actor driven stories. Mm -hmm. And the connection to those is in screenplay. So if Shape of Water is winning picture, is it going to win screenplay? Can it it win without screenplay? I don't think it can, even though I'm picking it. I mean, I really think we might watch an actual time where we see all the films and original screenplay winning a major award, but all going to a different movie. Like, let's say, Get Out wins screenplay, um, Shape of Water wins director, and Lady Bird wins best picture. Like, I could see that happening. I could absolutely see that, too. And it's driving me crazy. But again, like most of this season, it's been what's like so fun about it. I love it. I mean, I really do feel like they're battling themselves because they kind of ticked along during the critics, like side by side. They get out lost, like to Lady Bird, like by one vote or two votes at the National Society. It, otherwise, it would have le- it would have led those awards. But Lady Bird just edged it out barely. And well, what's edging it out? It isn't that the people love the movie that much. What it is, I mean, they do probably, but it's more it's more that they want to make a statement about women this year, and this is the year to do it, right? It's right after the hideous election, 
it's the Me Too movement. It's the Time's Up movement. It's angry Natalie Portman, you know, spitting out all five male nominees. <laughs> and it's Kristen Bell sitting down and going, Greta Gerwig is the greatest human being who ever walked the face of this earth. So, you know, those two things are like, you know, they're pitches. They're pitches. And I, you know, when you see that, I noticed it in Telluride. I noticed it because everybody loved the movie before they even saw it. And then I noticed it again when I watched the greatest reviewed film of all time on Rotten Tomatoes. Like there was this like push, this like cradling and push and like, come on, guys, give us this, you know, give us this one movie. And that's what you want in a preferential ballot. You want a movie that people push to the top, you know, for, for whatever reason. People kept saying last year that the reason Moonlight won was because it was oh, the Oscars so white year. And that's not really why. Um, as far as I could tell, because Fences was also nominated and Hidden Figures was too. So, well, I think have... there, I think there were a lot of factors with that, with with, yeah. with that winning. It's not yeah. just one thing. But it really it was very emotionally transcendent, is how I would describe that movie. And and that you remember that stays in your heart. And when you're voting, you just you look at it and you go, yeah, you know, I thought Manchester by the Sea was the best. Oh, but Moonlight. You know, so like Moonlight will be like number two, right, or three. And and if you have the choice between Moonlight and La La Land, you're going to put Moonlight ahead of it. I think that's what's going to happen with Lady Bird and Get Out um, based on all of those factors. But I could be wrong. It could be Get Out for the similar reasons, you know. Um, it's just that Get Out is a dark, hardcore, dark movie, you know. Yeah, and I just, I, 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 I feel like, like, like Get Out and Lady Bird are the two movies that, feel like the winners they don't have the 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 guild behind back up behind them as much and BAFTA and all those things they don't have that as much behind them as as other movies do but um again we're just in such a different era of this kind of thing where it's it's takes more than just you know hitting hitting every guild that's right, for sure. You're so right about that. I mean, think of all that's changed and just did the membership alone. Yeah, you know? exactly. We, we we saw, you know, six hundred and thirty eight new members. And again, you know, when you when you spelt these numbers, it doesn't mean that everybody's gonna accept the invitation and, and vote. But you work on the presumption that everybody votes and just go with that. So that was that was six hundred and thirty eight new members the year that Moonlight won. Uh and you know, what we had just before Moonlight was the election, which did not go the way that I think obviously most liberals and most Hollywood would have thought that it would have gone. And right. one of the other things that, that uh, uh, Kyle Buchanan had said was, if Hillary had won, La La Land probably would have won. I agree with that. Because uh, there would have been a, a sense of relief and, and like, yes, we can enjoy a movie like this and celebrate it. But then she lost and then things get more, they became more serious. Oh, yeah. People started to look at the movie with, with, fur with fury because it looked like, it looked like a, a, a you know, a, a, like a rules of the game kind of thing where it's like we're tap dancing while the world burns you know yeah. and that was a really hard thing for people to swallow at that time so they started picking it apart unfairly you know um but nonetheless it's you know i look at these movies and i think am i crazy to stick to the sag stat because bafta right bafta is a five ballot race the revenant won there la la land won there um and if you look, I mean, Twelve Years a Slave beat Gravity there, but but does it does it mean that if there wasn't a preferential ballot, that La La Land would have won without the SAG stat? Does it mean that The Revenant would have won without the SAG? Probably, you know. Mm -hmm. If it was five, if it was a five movie race, probably, you know, the momentum would have pushed them through. Um, but the preferential ballot doesn't reward momentum, you know. It yeah. doesn't unless it goes on the first round. Uh, Birdman it, had momentum. Yeah, it it, it did, but it, it had momentum in the same way that that the King's Speech did, um, and it's it's so crazy how similar those trajectories were. In that, you know, one movie was you know leading all the way up to you know with kind of Critics' Choice and Golden Globes and just kind of and and just working its way toward, and then you get to the guilds and stopped dead. And that's mm -hmm. what happened with Boyhood. And then it, the the 
table was completely flipped and and it it was Birdman all the way. Yeah. They didn't um, like being told what they were supposed to pick, I think. And you know, in those instances it seemed like both of those were like rebukes of the movie that like Social Network for instance was winning like a ridiculous amount. It won like everything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm sure that by the time they got to the Academy, they're like, this isn't that good. I like this other movie a lot better, you know? And and it, it sort of changed the direction of the race, possibly. You know, I, the momentum for Birdman makes me think that they didn't like Boyhood, that they were mad about Boyhood, and they really did not want to choose it. It only won one Oscar after all that. Well, I, I wonder if... If there was, and I, I know, feel like we're, you know, rehashing all these old wins, but I think it's impossible not to talk about, you know, precedent and, and you know, what can lead up to, to this year. I, I, I think that the Academy does often attach a seriousness and an importance level to a lot of, of their movies. They might have seen Boyhood as a, uh, a really good film, but just not uh, important. Um, I sort of fear that for Lady Bird because a lot of the, maybe not negative response to it, but a lot of response that isn't, you know, super positive is, okay, well, why is Greta Gerwig getting directing nominations? It's just a girl coming of age movie. And the dismissal of that is just kind of always drives me insane because then, then I'd be like, okay, Christopher Nolan fan, I would love to see him do this movie. How about that? Well, and when I, I catch myself thinking that, because I do, I think things like if it was directed by a man, there's no way it would have this kind of attention on it. But Juno thing, did. But Juno Juno was a better movie. <laughs> so, I, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Juno had so much in it. It had that great performance by Ellen Page. It had a point. You know, it wasn't just sort of a... But I know a lot of people relate to Lady Bird, and I don't want to shit on it. I really don't. I, I don't you know. relate to it at all, but it's. I love it. It's, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people really like it, and that's not easy to do. So it does show. And But when I start thinking that way, I, I'm, I'm reminded of movies that did get in directed by men that I didn't think were all that great. I watched Michael Clayton the other day. That movie was not very good. <laughs> it's, it, like, it doesn't hold up very well now. It's, you know? a, it's a competent movie, but there is there is nothing like spectacular about it. Yeah. Right. But that's so that's that's the other that's my other side of the coin with Lady Bird. I, I see it as okay, this is a fantastic um uh culmination of uh of pushing uh women in 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 film and in hollywood and not just there but everywhere um but is it uh important enough will it be regarded as important enough versus something like get out which is clearly a huge massive social statement and Mm. we you know we may be a full year from moonlight's win but socially and nationally, we are not only, you know, not far from uh, issues of, of race and gender, but they are even more uh, upfront than they were a year ago. So both of these movies and both of these filmmakers are going to have more visibility. And they should. But that's their problem, is that... Yes. There's the get out people who are going to be so into it and push it and love it and feel like it, you know, not only speaks to them, but speaks to their generation. You know, the Oscars are always criticized for not being part of the new generation of, of young people. And Get Out was a movie that wasn't even aimed for the Oscars. It just, it was like a movie he made on $4 million. Mm-hmm. It made 170. It's just a great movie. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, he never intended it to go this far. In fact, when we started, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, no. There must be somebody dropping something off. But, um, do you want me to keep talking or wait till they stop? It, it's, it's up to you. If you want to, if you want to go see what's up with them, that's sure. Go ahead. Oh, care. no, they do this all the time. It's just, if somebody walks by the door, this is what they do. <laughs> wait. Okay, Jack, come on, good boy. Come on. <laughs> All right, so um, oh, what was I gonna say? 
uh, what were we talking about? Get Out, right? Yes. Great Get movie. Out. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this is what I was going to say, but I guess what I will say is that, you know, there's going to be people who are pushing that movie, but then there's also the Natalie Portmans, you know, who are really going to be pushing Greta Gerwig and, and Lady Bird. And they're going to be going door to door and they're going to be talking to people. You got Lisa Tabak and Cynthia Schwartz on it. Yep. And it's produced by Scott Rudin. I mean, it's it's hardcore aimed to win. It's built to win. You know, they want it to win. Um, I don't blame them. Of course they would. Anybody would. Uh, so who's going to edge out whom? Like what movie are those two? Or is it going to be tipped in the direction of Shape of Water because those two movies kind of... I guess we'll find out at the WGA because the three are going to go up against each other. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to see how that turns out. I do feel like Jordan Peele should be able to win it, though. Well, okay, well, if Jordan Peele wins screenplay, then you follow the screenplay, then he's, that Get Out's probably going to win Best Picture. I, 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 I have to feel like that's the case, but, it, you know, then it, it only got four nominations. It didn't get an editing nomination. Lady right. Bird only got five. It didn't get an editing nomination. And we right. know that isn't that locked in, but we also know the reason that Birdman did not get an editing nomination. So it really exists outside of, yeah. of the normal rules. And Get Out really should have gotten one because it has great. Uh, and, yeah, it really Lady should. Lady Bird's good, but it's it, Get Out's is noticeable. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's crazy. It's they know I can't. They know I can't get up and make them stop. Come on, doggies. Jack. Jack, come here. Jack. Come here. Sorry, Eric. I'm so sorry. It's chaos around here. No, my cat gave up. She left. She's like, oh. he's not going to open the door for me. <laughs> Poor kitty. <laughs> yes. uh, every time I do one of these, it's, I have to say, you know, oh my God, the dogs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Crazy dog. <laughs> ruining my life. No. Um, um, do you agree with that? That um, I mean, it, it does sort of feel like it's down. Because see, she, sh neither of them were nominated for... Uh, well, she was nominated for the um, the Globe screenplay. screenplay, but he wasn't. And then no. he won the Critics' Choice screenplay, and Lady Bird got completely shut out of the Critics' Choice. Yep. So and, what? And SAG. Right. Okay. So that's not good. I know. That's not good because I don't think I can think of a time in all of history that a movie won Best Picture without winning a single Critics' Choice award. Now, it could be down to the critics. You know, the, what we're seeing now is something we've never seen before, which is the Oscar nominations coming out after all this stuff, you know? Yeah, the timelines of everything is, is so completely different. So, again, we have to treat every year as its own animal because it really is. Right. We, we, we can look at last year and we can look at, at, at certain history, but it's it's not going to necessarily be representative of now because – the the membership has changed and something too that i that i always try and stress is that while the academy membership has made some really dramatic uh uh efforts in increasing uh you know women and younger people and international members and and people of color the guilds have not made that same change so their makeup is not that different so right. we're, go we're going to see, I think, more and more diversion between guilds and the academy as a result. Yeah, certainly timeline wise. And, and uh, you know, if the Producers Guild and the SAG gave out their winners before they ever even knew what the Oscar nominations were, I mean, they might have turned out the same, but they might have not. You know, something might have shifted a little bit when they saw that Martin McDonald was left off, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It and, might not have won there. Yeah, and 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 you know, s voting doesn't even start for a month, and a lot can happen in a month. Oh God, yes. Oh my goodness, a lot can happen. It's really a whole month, huh? It's a whole month. It doesn't start till the twentieth of February. So we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna sit around waiting for the shit storms. <laughs> yep, and we already had two of the three major guilds have already announced, so we're only waiting for DGA, and so at that point, it's like you know, getting together the little crumbs of, of all of the other uh, uh, guilds, which aren't, you know, going to do a whole lot, uh, I, I think, to give us too many answers. I think what we really need to be doing is 
keeping our, our ear to the ground of everything from whisper campaigns to, um, you know, hearing what people are really liking. And obviously, you know, movies that they're seeing and that are on top of their screener pile and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, my theory about Shape of Water is that the reason it didn't get picked in the early part of the race was because people hadn't actually watched it because they didn't really want to watch it. My experience with people is that they go for the movies that have the biggest, flashiest stars in them first, that that goes right to the top of the pile, or something to do with sex. And as soon as they heard that like there's sex with a with an amphibian creature or whatever, <laughs> they wanted to watch it. And once they watched it, they thought, oh, wow, this is really good, you know. So, um, but but it's still, you know, it's a definite win at the BAFTAs, I think. But um, but what do you think of the DGA? The problem with the DGA is that Jordan Peele's up for first time. So, the, you know, what's to stop them from going, well, I can award both. I can do Jordan Peele for Get Out, and I can do Guillermo del Toro for Shape of Water. That's exactly what I think is going to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, I, it's... I feel more comfortable about that than almost anything <laughs> in the coming yeah. month. <laughs> I sort of do too, except for um, there's a tiny, tiny part of me that thinks if it really is late like that, you know, is it going to give Dunkirk time to build momentum? Because, you know, this kind of thing can sometimes happen where, but this is what happened with Moonlight. A lot of, a lot of it would have, you know, that they're telling, they told everybody that the front runner was La La Land. But then people started to get to talking, and then you started to hear them all talking about Moonlight, you know. So what if people start saying, you know, I can't believe Dunkirk isn't winning. Dunkirk's the best movie of the year. Yes, Dunkirk. Oh, my God, have you seen Dunkirk? And, and it starts to surge a little bit. That's the only way I could see there being any sort of upset in that trajectory for, for Guillermo. I, see, I, I don't see how you could build momentum for a movie that came out in July. Right. <laughs> that's that's my thing. It's there is there is no momentum to be had for a movie like that. It's already fully established. Right. So I mean, it's it's a big hit, and that's great. Um, and got its eight nominations, uh, which is good. It we don't have a best picture nominee in visual effects this year, which is a little odd. Um, uh. Uh, but actually, eight is to be honest a, l a little bit underwhelming. Grant yeah. granted. Uh, it didn't have a shot in acting or, or in writing. That wasn't really in the cards for it. So. Right. So that's another strike against it, you know. And 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 now we're if we're talking about Lady Bird. We're talking about um, no BAFTA uh, directing nomination, no BAFTA picture nomination, no prizes won at Critics Choice, no prizes won at SAG. Right. Yep. So I don't. I probably don't even have to look at my stats to know that that's that's an impossibility. That that's never happened before. Um, uh, I know Moonlight was missing the directing nomination at at BAFTA, but not the picture. No, but it's almost the closest thing because Moonlight. The yeah, thing. Moonlight only won you know picture at the Globe, just like Lady Bird. Um, yeah. It's it's actual wins. You know, getting up to the Oscars were were really meager. Um, but I mean, at least Mahersha Ali won SAG, so. He kept winning in that, you know, that kept bringing people to see the movie. Um, I think Gre Greta Gerwig, I'm not going to count out Lady Bird, but having this conversation with you has made me think that I'm probably going to edge Get Out just behind Shape of Water on my uh, my list because because of those wins which i hadn't really been thinking about but putting those two things together makes me wonder if it can win anything you know? it, it, it exactly and i i end up and i say this almost every podcast that every time i i do a podcast i end up changing some something because yeah. you know i'm i'm going around in my own head with this information and looking at it on my screen of, of does this make sense and then you know you throw stuff back and forth with somebody like this and and things can change and i i, right. I do that all the time <laughs> and you know the other thing to think about is um the critics choice folks kind of went nuts for i Tonya, and so it beat lady bird in, in all their comedy categories um like lady bird couldn't even beat uh, I talk for comedy or comedy actress or anything like that i know so with i Tonya sort of out now it's possible that it could sort of regain some of the footing that it's lost it's, since it's not in competition with that movie anymore, you know? Yeah, that was a bit of a surprise the, that it underperformed a little bit as, as it did. 
Um, and I know since this is, you know, the reaction podcast, we should probably talk a little bit about stuff like that, like the snubs and, and surprises and things that we yeah. like. Cause, cause, um, uh, I, Tanya had talk about momentum and just blowing up at the right time. Uh, it, it made a lot of sense that it could hit screenplay and picture I know. Uh, and it missed both. I was shocked, but and I was a little bit bummed out that I, Tanya, Molly's Game, and Wonder Woman were all dropped from the PGA's list. I that kind of sucked, you know. Yes, it was definitely a little less female driven than uh, PGA was. <laughs> and then we all thought it was going to turn out to be this kind of a year, and um, we did that in 2015 too. Right, I know, which, so true. And which, sooner or later, they they rear their, you know. Their, their, their male, <laughs> <laughs> alpha male head. And they say no. You know, we like our stories driven by men. <laughs> well, so I don't know. I mean, okay. So what's a, that's the the three billboard snub is the biggest one. That's the most surprising. It is, and and on on the flip side of that, the humongous uh, showing for Phantom Thread is. Yeah. Uh, that's like my number two movie of the year. I could not be happier that it that it happened. I am so excited for that. Yeah. Um, and it's really wild because then it just makes me think, okay, this this is one of the two super late December releases, the other one being The Post, which did not do well. Um, but somehow people really sought it out. And you, you mentioned before, you know, that, that, you know, people watch screeners and do watch movies that have the bigger stars, but that did not happen with, with the post. It certainly, no, uh, that was probably the biggest, that is the post is one of the biggest shockers for me of, and I didn't even, I mean, I didn't really like the movie, but I'm just saying like, um, I was surprised that it didn't do as well as everybody said it was going to do. Like Two I think who nominations. Scott Feinberg at one point was predicting it to win Best Picture, I think. Like, really, really thought it was going to go all the way, you know. Um, and so it went all the way from that point. And he also really loved I, Tonya too. And I wonder what he thinks about that now, because he was really bullish on it. And well, if- he, he can be very bullish on, on movies. It's like as soon as, like, somebody is on his podcast, he'll do right, his new right. predictions. And then all of a sudden, they're, like, number one or number two. So right, right, I, I don't put a whole lot. Of, <laughs> I don't put a whole lot of stock in that. Right. But, no, um, I know. I don't either. But I was just to to to, to illustrate how it went from such a perception wise, yes. not reality wise, but perception wise, it went from a high place. People keep saying, you know, what about the post? What about the post? And and they would also say to me, what about Phantom Thread? You know, and I didn't have an answer for that because it didn't seem like based on what we knew so far that it was going to be, even though we know that they love Paul Thomas Anderson and that they often make room for him at the end, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I, I wonder if the post was sort of received at least by voters as here's the movie that you're supposed to vote for because it's super important and freedom of the press is under attack right now. And, and here you go. And, and this is, this is the movie that you need to support. Um, but as, even though I really like the movie, it is a very low key stayed film, uh, yeah. even, even for Spielberg. And it sort of feels like it exists in a different time period um and and i think maybe voters and 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 others are thinking this is 2018 and we need something with more bite right maybe so because it was a little bit frustrating to watch a movie where the main thrust of it was is she going to come around and publish these we already knew she was going to and i think the juice of that movie is the pentagon papers and all of the stuff that was around that and if it had been around that just that i think it would have been a little more urgent you know than it than it turned out to be whereas it was really just kind of a character study mostly of her and then blended in with with the other story of suspense somewhere in there is a really really great movie yeah Um, you know, it's almost a good, but I think you're right. Like there's just something about it that doesn't feel like it's tapping into what's happening right now. Yeah. I, 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 and it's funny cause you know, when, when it was first announced way back in, in May and that it was going to be fast tracked and, and out this year, you know, it was really easy to grab onto that and go, 
okay, this is going to be super zeitgeisty and it's going to be really important. And it's Spielberg and it's uh, Streep and Tom Hanks and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, how is this movie's unstoppable? Um, <laughs> and and you know that's that's a reasonable thing to think at at the time. Uh, and then it was racing against the clock to get seen. Um, it got completely shut out of SAG um, for multiple reasons. Um, and people were just not here for it. They just, they were, like I said, there were other things that were more crucial, uh, or at least presented their stories in a way that was more, uh, urgent. And there was such a lack of urgency in the movie until like the last third one, then everything is like, oh my God, is it going to happen? So it's, I, 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 again, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a movie for a different era of Oscars. Yeah, and it's going to do perfectly fine at the box office. It's a, there's a big audience for that kind of movie, for sure. It's oh, it already fun. is. It's doing great. Oh, yeah, with a co competition like this, which is really intense, when you have movies like The Shape of Water, Get Out, Lady Bird, you've got these really bold font films. You know, it's, it's hard <laughs> for for that movie to, to co compete. And the other problem, I think, is with it is that they embargoed it. And I don't think they expected the word of mouth to be as good as it turned out to be after the movie. And holding that in and stifling it, I think, hurt it because it needed that. It needed people to talk about it and build prestige around it and for that to echo out, you know, to people so that they could know that they're supposed to, you know, uh, think of it that way. That it, it doesn't look like it does. It isn't just this boring movie that you think you see when you look at the poster, you know, that there's more to it than that. I don't know if they would still have come around or not, you know, maybe not. Um, I know that's going to be a tough one for them later to, to talk about how why, how or why that movie that seemed targeted right for the Oscars would not have been in the Oscars. You know, it might yeah. turn out to be a head scratcher 10 years from now even. Yeah, know? exactly. Um, I definitely want to talk about uh, Mudbound. Um, I know both of us are pretty, it, probably pretty excited for its performance. Obviously, it didn't make it in picture and director, but this was this was going to be an extremely extremely important year for Netflix uh, to see if they could break through outside of the documentary categories, and they did. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing so, set a lot of uh, records, and it's I it's huge, it's major. Um, yeah. Rachel Morrison became the first woman nominated for uh, best cinematography in 90 years ever amazing ever i think i think there's like what was it 621 or 650 nominees in this category and That's she insane. is the first woman and it's beautiful cinematography exactly it's just beautiful it's um, it's fantastic i'm sure they're happy at netflix because they've been they worked nobody worked harder on the beasts of no nation campaign than they did and to see it just completely shut out, I think that was a teaching moment for the Academy to know that they they shut out Idris Elba in that part just because it was Netflix. Really, are they going to do that? So Mary J. Blige got in. She got into the acting category, which is fabulous. Uh, and song, and she became the first person ever to do that in the same year. And she cried when she heard she was nominated, which oh, is so sweet. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, this is, that's definitely that Phantom Thread, Shape of Water, and. Um, uh, Mudbound are my top three favorite films of the year. So it was really a good day for me in terms of the movies that I love. Yeah, it, it was mostly for me too. I mean, I, I was uh, saddened by uh, Call Me By Your Name just getting four. Uh, I'm glad that it got in song, but I was I was just desperately hoping for um, for the Academy to, to, to bite with Michael Stuhlbarg and, and, and get him in. I, I was really, 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 really hoping for that. That would have um, been great. I, I don't know that uh, his part was big enough is the only problem with that for me. Like, I always thought he's not, they're not going to nominate him for just that one scene, you know? Uh, I don't know. It's at the end. It has the most impact. So it, it, yeah. it could know. be. But what worried me about Call Me By Your Name was when Army Hammer didn't get a SAG. I thought, that's weird, mm -hmm. you know? It seemed like it. He should have. He's beloved. He's great in the movie. It's it's bizarre that he wasn't nominated. Um, Steve Carell for Battle. I mean, I love Battle of the Sexes, but he's not the best thing about it. So. <laughs> no, that 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 was definitely a moment where we're like, oh, okay, 
That was just so weird for that to be the only award that that movie got. Any, and that's like Molly's game. It's like the only recognition it gets is Aaron Sorkin's screenplay, and you know she doesn't get in for Best Actress. And um, but really quickly, do you think that the front runners, the acting front runners, are all set? Do you think it's McDormand, um, Oldman, Janney, and Rockwell, or do we think it's gonna break up now that the okay? Set? Here's here's the thing. Um, and, and this is, this is what I wrote in my, uh, who are the front runners now this morning? Um, because there's never in, in the, the history of these four awards that, uh, all the same four people won critics choice, golden globe, SAG, BAFTA, and then Oscar. It's never happened ever. Oh God. Wow. It got very, very, very close in 2014 when everybody won all of those except for Eddie Redmayne lost uh, Critics' Choice to Michael Keaton. But mm. but that was a pretty minor ding. So if you take Critics' Choice out of that component, then it just happened a couple of years ago. But the thing about it is that the people that won in 2014 outside of, of uh, Redmayne came in with critics wins. J.K. Simmons and Patricia Arquette were by a long shot the critics' favorites. And that is not the case this year. Willem Dafoe and Laurie Metcalf are by far the bigger yeah. critics' favorites. And they are losing. These four winners, not one of them has NBR, National Society of Film Critics, L.A. or New York. That will be a first ever. If that happens. Wow, that's it's, really trippy. So I feel like something is going to change in the next month. So in looking at that, I have to see who's the most vulnerable and why. And well, he, I would think that Sam Rockwell might be. Vulnerable. I think Sam Rockwell is because if you're going to look at, at three billboards as problematic, it's his character that's the most problematic to people. Right. And and he will suffer for it rather than McDonough's screenplay, which is sure. unfair in that sense. No, no, but it's true, though. He will, absolutely, because not because they don't think he gave the best performance, but because they don't want to be party to a shitstorm. They don't want to be party to a controversy. And if they vote for him, that's going to mean to a lot of people that he, they're voting for a racist. So they're not going to want to do that, right? So that's a po potential. The only sticking point with that is that he's very, 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 very popular in Hollywood. So He is, but they, essentially they he's he's playing the same version of, of, of Matt Dillon's character in Crash. Oh, no. I mean, it is. It's the racist cop that does, like, the one right thing. And then, right. and then he's, like, all of a sudden, like, super cool and awesome and everybody loves him and right. that's that is the perception but he's not a theater matt Dillon was never a theater actor sam rockwell is he has the respect okay so here's the other thing about that is if sam rockwell going down i don't know that willem defoe's the guy because look uh, at, i do i think so but look at florida project completely ignored i know and and him winning as as a as a sole nominee for the for the film is is a stretch for so sure. So who else in the supporting category? If it wasn't those two, just say for example, who would come up and be Christopher Plummer? <laughs> oh my God! Uh, maybe I, it's Christopher Plummer. <laughs> well, it just seems so weird that that it could be him. Um, it does, but it it could sort of be him because he's revered and. Uh, you know, he did such an kind of an amazing thing that the he did a really great job. He is incredible in that movie. Yeah, so that's a good. Pro my problem with Willem Dafoe, and I know you you love him. I love the movie too. But after I heard all the stuff about his performance, I saw it and I was like, God, you know, dude, that is really subtle. Like that, I don't know how that wins. I mean, he's barely. He has one scene where he chases down the child molester, but most of it is just him kind of being stoic and looking after this kid. You know? Well, Ma Mahershala Ali just won doing that, so. Yeah, but he's Mahershala. <laughs> but, he, but he was in the Best Picture winner. <laughs> he was the Best Picture winner. I think that's the difference. I think at the time people thought, 
we're going to give him this award because it's going to be Moonlight's one big award. Mm -hmm. You know, like I really think they were thinking that way because I don't, nobody saw it coming that it was going to turn out to win, but it was going to get this one big award and that's a really, and maybe screenplay, you know, and that would be fantastic for the movie that it turned out to win best picture too. But it's, it's always nice to have one. If Florida project had gotten in for best picture, I would be more inclined to think that, but I, uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, Yeah. And he is beloved. He's never won an Oscar. He's been in every movie. He knows everybody in the Academy. They have a chance to award him. He's playing a good guy, you know? So what Willem Dafoe would also do is he would take that, uh, that stat I just mentioned that none of these front runners have any major wins. Uh, and he would, he would break that because he has all of them. Right. He has LA, New York, NBR and National Society of Film Critics. The only other person to get all of those and lose is Michelle Pfeiffer when she lost to Jessica Tandy. Oh, That's horrible. <laughs> so it's happened. There's certainly precedent for it. But Oh God. I, I looked I look at Defoe as the, the the spoiler in this four. I'm not saying it's gonna happen. It's it's it I think the odds should favor the four front runners. Yeah, but uh, I, I think that you're on to something with that. When then it's a month and you know, something's gonna happen. The only good thing for three billboards, the only plus for it, is that it got that ding in director, so people are gonna lay off and they're not gonna be hitting it so hard. Mm-hmm. And if it hadn't, it would have just been, you know, really, really raked over the coals, and then you really would have seen some. So I don't know if they're gonna continue to award the film or not. I don't know. We don't know where that sentiment is going to go. Um, but we do know there's a lot of people of color in the Academy now. And uh, it's, that's changed a lot. Um, I feel like those kind of new sort of woke members are going to be splitting up their votes between Lady Bird and, and get out. Um, the traditionalists will want to do darkest hour and Dunkirk, you know, and, and then, all the women and romantics, uh, people who love Guillermo, um, you know, the magical realism of the Mexican filmmakers, the, you know, mm-hmm. the famous, I don't know if it's, is it racist to say the three amigos because that's what everybody used to call them way back when? No, because they call themselves that. Yeah. So he's the last amigo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing that the last amigo is about to win a direct. So they'll all three have. It's literally part of their the narrative so yeah that's great though I, I love that i mean i haven't really read it many places that people were talking about that fact but i think it's so cool that you know and you could really write a really wonderful book about that kind of magical realism sort of sweeping through the academy and what that meant and you know it's so exceptional to have mexican directors win like that you know it's just in terms of academy history it's unprecedented you know well i like that there there's a certain, you know, symbiosis to, you know, this Mexican storytelling and then, you know, Coco being, you know, an obvious and clear front runner yeah. as well. Oh, for sure. And and the great thing about Del Toro, he'll stick it to Trump so bad when he you know, gets up there. He really will. Because I've seen him speaking, you know, tell your right or whatever, and he definitely lets loose on that. Yeah, um, but also talk about somebody who everybody loves. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, he's so great. <laughs> Del, Tor- Del Toro covers like every possible base for a film goer, even like the the most you know just barely passing film goer is you know fascinated by what he does. Uh, cinephiles are love how much of a film fan he is. He's yeah. super friendly. I mean, there he's got like zero zero things against him. But, and, you know, I took my daughter to see uh, Shape of Water with her, with my niece. And, you know, we sat there and we watched it and just, and I, second time I'd seen it because I never got the screener for it. So, you know, normally I would have watched it like a million times, like 20 times by now or something. But I've only saw it the one time and then I saw it again. And I just was so, like, blown away by how that movie delivers on every level, how it keeps you on the edge of your seat, how it gives you that incredible happy ending you know, it's full of romance and surprise and, you know, these these wonderful sad characters, you know, rise up and defy the horrible boss. Like, there's just so much to it. It's such a enriching and fulfilling cinematic experience, you know, that I think is, uh, 
people are craving, you know, especially when they go to the movies. I don't know how it plays on screener, you know, I have no idea. But if you go to the, I mean, when I was there, it was like the middle of the day in Burbank, you know, with like, you know, just a regular audience, not cinephiles at all. And they applauded at the end. Mm-hmm. That, that's pretty cool. It is. It's you know? like, yeah, like we said, it, it, it ticks a lot of boxes. It's, yeah. And it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and <laughs> I know we just said last year, if there's any movie that's going to break the SAG cast stat, it'll be La La Land. It has 14 nominations. Oh, of course it's going to. I know, I know, I know. You know, and so here we are again, well, try, that... trying to make the same argument. Although this is a, a, a very different movie. We're in a different world. Uh, it, and, you know maybe it will happen. <laughs> well, the other weird thing about that, and I think I mentioned this to you on Twitter, which is that I was so convinced after I did my polls and they kept showing Moonlight to be the winner. It was like two days before the Oscars. And I yeah. predicted at the last minute, I switched my prediction just based on those polls. I thought, you know what, maybe. And if it does, that's going to be really cool to get that right. If I get it wrong, who cares? Yeah. And, um, and I probably wouldn't have done it if I had known that he was the first director since Braveheart to win without it winning any major of the guilds and I it never clicked in my mind that because I never even went looking for that mm-hmm. I was only looking at he has the SAG stat he has a DGA stat and this is how the poll results came out but if I'd looked at that I might have gone wait that's as lo- much of a long shot as La La Land so I don't know you know they're both really long shots yeah uh, to e- win e- exactly and so all, all we can do is 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 look at at you know what happens after and then and see how that impacts the the next year so i i I do think that 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 we need to look at last year at la la land and moonlight at the election at time's up at everything that has happened in this last year it's never just about the movie so there's there's always multiple factors yeah and you know um One thing we have to pay attention to, which is how they're performing, like in their live appearances and how they are with each other in audiences. And you know, Greta Gerwig is charming. You know, Jordan Peele is really funny. You know that Guillermo del Toro is like the most charming human being (laughs) in Mm -hmm. the world. So, you know, I'm sort of going to be paying attention to that kind of stuff, like how it's all playing backstage you know yeah. what the, i know that i've already heard a dirty rumor about get out i've already heard a dirty rumor about shape of water i haven't heard anything negative about Lady Bird, which is probably a good indication of <laughs> of why but um so those things are going to like you said they're going to be whisper campaigns and they're going to be pushed you know um yeah. i don't know if they'll work or if they'll stick but we'll see yeah well um I, this is probably a pretty good place to have a nice, you know, quick, concise uh, uh, ending here. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my God, I could do this for the next three hours. No, and, I know. I know. And, and look partner, at all of these. But I've been sitting here for an hour, like petting my dog. He's like, I mean, you're probably going to hear it on the podcast. He's like panting and panting. <laughs> He's been bugging me. So um, I hope it hasn't been intrusive um, on the podcast. But um, it was really, really great talking with you. And I appreciate your asking me to do it. Oh, my gosh. It's there. You were the first person I was like, I need to, we need to do this. We've, we've we need to, to hash this. it out. <laughs> yes, we got to hash this out. <laughs> exactly um all right so yes uh please always always uh visit sasha at awards and uh on twitter and me at awards underscore watch on twitter and awardswatch.com um so all that's left next is just kind of waiting for guilds to fall and mm. listen to some chatter and and go from there, right? Yep, it's going to get ugly. It's going to be a bloodbath. It, just prepare yourselves. It, it always is. <laughs> so we'll just have to see who comes out the most unscathed. Um. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cutie. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. That sounds good. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.